First draft pick, 1998 draft. Who was number one? Colts fans? Peyton Manning, of course. Do you remember who number two was? Absolutely right, Ryan Leaf. Probably most of you don't know that, never heard the name. Two Hall of, future Hall of Famers that one made it, one did not. Today we're going to be talking about Hall of Famers and that each one of you can be in a Christian Hall of Fame. I hope that's something that you aspire to. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 12 talks about the faithful of the faith, no matter who you are, where you are, how you're called, God has a place for you in his Hall of Fame. All right, now let me ask you another thing. 2000, uh, 2000 NFL draft, seventh round draft choice, number 199. Do you know who that was? Actually, I think it was sixth round. I think I got that wrong up there. Who? Tom Brady. Absolutely. Boy, you guys are good. First service didn't know any of this. I'm impressed. Tom Brady. How many Super Bowls has Tom Brady won? Seven. Six or seven. It was close. The person we Colts fans love to hate, possibly greatest of all times, 199th round draft choice. In fact, he was home during the draft and they didn't know whether, he didn't know whether he would get picked or not. Isn't that crazy? Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all times. The difference was their determination, their discipline, their attitude, their focus on what mattered for them to win. I loved when uh, the Colts had camp in Terre Haute and uh, uh, one of my family members got to see their team often. He ran a bar is why. And, and he said that constantly they were working on teamwork and developing each other and had a family type of relationship. Now, you might, be, might, not, might not be a sports fan at all. You might not care about athletics at all. But like I said, God has a Hall of Fame and every one of you deserve to be in it. Now, we're in this series, and if you're joining us online today, we're in 2 Timothy. This is only the second week. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and this is Paul's farewell letter. This is what he's writing to Timothy. He's imprisoned in Rome, knowing that this is going to be the last days of his life. And he says to Timothy, this is how to live like a hall of famer in Christ. How do we do that? And we're going to look at what scripture says in this passage today. But first, you are to hold yourself to a higher standard. Hold yourself to a higher standard. If you have your Bibles or your whatever, phones or, or tablets or whatever, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civil, civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, and they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Folks, Paul is telling Timothy to hold themselves to a higher standard. 
a higher standard. Then he goes on in verse 15 and he says this, do your best. That is what we're called to do. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed who, and who correctly handles the word of truth. Paul is calling Timothy in his last days to a higher standard. And he's going to use three metaphors in this passage. And the first metaphor four is in verse 4. He says, no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Now, if you know any soldiers, you know any Marines, you know any uh, naval personnel, they live with total commitment, active duty. They're all the way, all or nothing. That's what they signed up for. Our son is a major in the Marine Corps. I talked to him. In fact, he called me at lunchtime this last Friday, and uh, I had to say, you know, Josh, I, I, I have to go hang a door, and I'm sorry. He said, well, I always call you at the worst time. See, they're out, in, he's out in Texas, in Monterey, or in Texas, California, in Monterey, California, and uh, doing his uh, graduate school work for the Marine Corps. And uh, what he says, what, what's interesting is, Every once in a while, you got to know Josh. He gets along with everybody. He's just got a good personality. He's not like his father. He, uh, he's better than that. And so he'll get set apart. He's the uh, lead officer in his class out there. And so he has some additional responsibility. And so he'll end up sitting with, if a general comes in, he has the opportunity or the obligation to make them happy. And so he says, Dad, I have to do research on these generals. And so he gets their bio and he digs in. And not only that, he and another officer have to entertain them. And then he has to have good questions that fit their interests that he could dialogue with them. I mean, he has to be prepared. That's total commitment. Because in other situations, it's life or death. Understand this. As Christians, there are no reserve. There's no reserves. You are only active duty. There is no Christian reserve army. You're it. You're active duty. Are you willing to hold yourself to the standard of total commitment? That you are totally committed to the cause of Christ. The Ecclesiastes writer writes it like this. Solomon writes it like this. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Do your very best. Paul writes Colossians and says it this way. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Your, your boss is not that person that's just a little bit higher than you at your office or your workplace. It's the Lord if you live in Christ. Second thing Paul, or second metaphor Paul talks about is to live with personal integrity. And, and notice the passage. He's talking about someone who competes. Similarly, this, that's a hard word to say. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Dave, in his communion meditation today, I like what he said. Because a lot of people take scripture out of context or want to fit scripture into the culture and say, well, that's really not what that means. This is what it means. And they change the meaning of the word of God. And it has immediately, immediate consequences for that person. And I think that's why a lot of Christian culture is suffering today because they don't take the Word of God seriously. Now, when I mention these names, you will remember them as people who did not follow the rules that disqualified himself. Lance Armstrong, Alex Rodriguez, Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire. Great athletes in their own right, but they did not play according to, to the rules. Are you willing to hold yourself to the standard of personal integrity. Are you willing to do that? To live like the rules apply to you? Because they do. 
God does not change. Paul writes Titus and very similar. He says this. He says, In everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. He's saying live a life in such a way that nobody can criticize or condemn you. And if they would and someone else hear it, they say, well, that doesn't sound like them. That is not them. I don't believe that. Live that way. Now, Paul has a third metaphor, and he says this. He says, live with patient expectation. That means to live with delayed gratification. That's hard to do. Yesterday, Cornerstone had a craft fair. And I was there with my, my wife, my, our daughter, and our grandchildren. And, and I'm telling you guys, there's not a lot of tools there. I didn't see anything that had to do with Milwaukee or DeWalt. <laughs> not at all. So, and they love that I go, but they only have one reason for me to go, and that's because I buy them what they want. <laughs> exactly. It's this. And our grandson, our four-year-old grandson, he has not learned delayed gratification yet. So his mother was going to buy him this toy. It was, what do you call that when the, there's this thing that makes thing, not a transformer, it's a plastic and it, whatever it is. Anyway, sorry, I digress. No, it's where... where uh, forget it. Don't, 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 just forget it. Anyway, it, it shapes and makes this thing and engineers it. It's really, you know, it's, I, I can't remember. No, no. <laughs> give up. I give up. Anyway, so mom was going to buy him something for Christmas, and that was not good enough, right? Wanted it now. Just like I want that word right now. And it wasn't happening, so Grandpa bought him a few things to satisfy him for now. Now, that did not teach him delayed gratification at all, did it? That rewarded his misbehavior. That's what grandpas are for. But look at verse 6. We're talking about delayed gratification. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Know anything about farming in Indiana? We do. You've got to wait. You plant, you fertilize, you wait. You will reap the harvest if you're patient. And in life, you build skill upon skill, doing the right thing upon the right thing, and you will reap a harvest. The question is, are you willing to hold yourself to a, a standard of patient expectation to lay gratification to reap the harvest? Paul says, let, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. It's so important. Don't give up. Hall of Famer Jerry Rice says it this way, Today I will do what others won't, so tomorrow I can accomplish what others can't. Are you willing to do that? To make a difference? Second, remember that people are your top priority. As I preach this series, I know I've said this over and over again. What is the only thing that's going to last throughout all eternity? What is the only thing that's going to go to heaven with you? And it is your relationships. It is other people that you're going to take with you. But remember, it's not about you. It's about the people you are called to serve. It's not about you. And that's so hard to accept, isn't it? It's not about you. Paul says it this way. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. You are the elect. You are the chosen. That they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The, the saying is trustworthy for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The people I serve are more important than any suffering I'll endure. 
Now, I've had a couple of challenging people in my life this last week, not church-related. So don't try to figure out who it is because it's not, they're not members of this church. They've never been to this church before. But they've been challenging for me. And, and the challenge is that they want, wanted certain things certain way, and I was saying no. And I said that we were having this text war, if you will. And uh, there was some ranting and there was some anger being expressed via text, which I hate to do. And so I would wait, I would delay, I would think about how I would respond, then I would type it, and then I would delete it. <laughs> Say that was not appropriate. And then I would go back, and then I would wait, and then I would pray, and then I would delay. So you don't ever want to text with me, because I may not respond for days. And then I responded with, this is what I'll do. And then they went into a tirade, and I just put down the phone. And even then, it wasn't over. Understand this, and, and, and I don't even like this quote. There is no I in team. I always, I, when I hear this, there is no I in team. But you know, there is me if you'd spell it back. That's what I always think. But, but truly, there is no I in team. Working together, it's not me first. It's me with not last, but not first. We are more important than me. The Church of Jesus Christ is more important than me. The kingdom of God is more important than me. The way we do things is more important than me for the kingdom of God. Paul says this in verse 2 of this passage, And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Christianity is one generation from extinction. It's what we pass on to that next generation that will make all the difference in the world. The gospel is about people telling people to tell people to tell people. That's what the gospel is about. It's about telling or people, the gospel is about people telling people to tell people to tell people about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we are saved by grace through faith. John Wesley said it this way, a man must have friends or make friends, for no one ever went to heaven alone. We take others with us. And finally, three, stick to what really matters. Folks, we can get lost in so many weeds. We can get lost on alternate paths. You see, people are dis easily distracted over insignificant matters. People get lost in the weeds so often. For us, it may be carpet color, room color, the what we wear. I get so tired of stuff like that. I, 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 I think that's insignificant because what really matters is that people experience salvation in Jesus Christ. Keep the main things the main things. Stick to what matters no matter what. Now, there were many self-important leaders in Timothy's time. Self-appointed leaders. People important in their own eyes who wanted to direct their attention toward lesser matters. That happens still today and devote their time arguing about secondary issues. Happens all the time. We shouldn't get distracted, but we need to stick to what matters. Paul said it this way, and I love this passage of Scripture. I've been trying to memorize this for 10 or 12 years. I'm, I'm pretty slow in, 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 in memorization. But Paul says this, and I think it's so important to hear. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of God. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more, or into more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Have you seen that happen? 
I have. Now notice what he says here, what Paul says to Timothy. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have swerved from the truth. <coughs> Paul, I mean, I love the way he doesn't pull punches. He calls them out. Now, do you think that Hymenaeus and Philetus changed their behavior because Paul called them out? And I would say, no. But what was Paul doing? He was sending a message to the whole congregation there in Ephesus of what not to do. So he's, he was teaching a lesson in this writing. Who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. Now we see, we see that in 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians 4, where the rapture, some think the rapture had already occurred, and Paul said, no, it's going to happen. Who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows who are his. And even today, the Lord knows who are his. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Depart from sin. So what's our instruction? Avoid irreverent babble. Don't get lost in the small stuff. Don't swerve from the truth. Stay with the main things. Don't get distracted. Paul goes on in this passage and he said, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for, dis for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set up part as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Paul says again, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. It just stirs things up. Don't waste your time on meaningless quarrels. Had another situation this week. Another uh, person who's not related to the church. And they wanted to do something and I wasn't going to let them do it. And I said, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do this for you. And then I brought some things in that they didn't even know they needed. And, I, and they yelled at me because I was fixing things they didn't know were broken. But they were broken. And so when I left, I left something that uh, the scrappers here in Brazil, if you leave anything outside on the street or on the sidewalk or on, in the yard, they'll come and get it. And so she texts me, it's a she, she texts me back and, and she was mad at me, but, but I, what I want to say, exceeded her expectations by miles and she complained about it. Okay. And I said, well, the scrappers will come and get it. And then I got, you know what my text was? Okay. <laughs> not thank you. And I did not text back what I wanted to. Like, you're welcome. <laughs> I just didn't respond. That's hard to do. No silly arguments. Don't get caught up in all that. Commit to face-to-face -face resolutions. You ever have to block someone? I have. Just block them. And then the next time I see them, eye-to-eye -eye resolution. Make a point to sit down eye-to-eye -eye and work things out. Here's another passage that I love that I'm also trying to memorize. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Oh, that's so hard able to teach patiently enduring evil. Oh, that's so hard. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. Oh, that's so hard. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. That's our hope. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. What we're talking about is not people. We're talking about spiritual warfare. The people are blinded and they are under the authority of, uh, of Satan. If they're not in Christ, 
Now, I know some immature Christians. Some of them are you. But those that are outside of Christ, they are under a different realm. Now, when we look at this, this would include criticism, gossip, and complaints. How do we deal with those? Those are going to come. But notice criticism, gossip, and, and complaints, those will not get you to the finish line. They will not make you a hall of famer because a hall of famer focuses on what really matters and allows everything else to go away. They know what is important. Paul said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for the building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You ever listen and watch how people respond to see what they can understand and, and, and perceive? That's what Paul's saying. And notice verse 22, flee from the evil desires of youth. Now, some of us aren't young anymore, but we still have some of these desires. These are still temptation. And so you've got to ask the question, well, what desires? Self-centeredness. It's all about me. Really, it's not. Impatient. Not delayed gratification. Arrogance. I know it all and no one else knows anything. Intolerance. Not allowing for differing opinions, differing approaches, temper tantrums. Dealt with those this week. Didn't get what they wanted, thought that the temper tantrum was going to work. Not so much. It just reveals our immaturity. There's another quarterback, Kurt Warner. They were, uh, he was, during a game... Uh, they kind of cut off to him. And Kurt Warner you know, won a couple Super Bowls, went to a couple Super Bowls, uh, was talking to one of the wide receivers on the sideline. Very heated conversation. They were going at it. What the wide receiver wanted was he wanted to uh, break 100 yards in receptions that game. Kurt, Kurt Warner said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get the ball to you if I can. But he also said this, but what about winning the game? See, Hall of Famers are about winning. Christians should be winning more souls than arguments. That's our priority. That's what matters most. Now, some of you that are sports fans, and I'm not that big of a sports fan, and you, you could do this in any field or industry, but you know what the last draft pick every year is called? You know what that title is? Some of you know that. It is Mr. Irrelevant. And it might be, this last year, I think it was number 257 or 259. I forget. But, but, but some of those Mr. Irrelevance that, that uh, had been uh, picked never get to play, never make it to camp, never, never get to uh, be on the football field as a professional athlete. But others of them do. And, and some of you say... Well, I'll never be a Hall of Famer. I'll, I'll never be the greatest of all time. I'm just a regular average person, and that's sort of how I feel, Mr. Irrelevant. But you've got to remember that in, in God's economy, every one of you are relevant, and you have a job to do, a calling to fulfill, because you're chosen, you're elect, and you are loved by a holy God who is calling you to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, calling you to pass the faith to that next generation. The question is, will you do it? Will you please stand as I pray? Eternal God and Father, we are grateful for this time. And Father, we're thankful for what Paul says to Timothy. And we're reminded, Father, that we want to be a part of that faithful hall of fame that we can be told by you well done good and faithful servant that we've obeyed and and follow through and fulfilled what we have been called to do by you and father just now for those that don't know jesus christ as lord savior i pray they would come to know you 
Father, for those that don't have a church family that need to have a church family, we pray that they will come and uh, join your, your church. Father, for those that are far from you that don't know you, we just pray that there will be one more step in the direction toward you and knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. Father, may we recommit our lives to giving our best for you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.